So, for those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Shelley Murphy. I'm an associate professor of communication here at Bristol. And this is the uh, Bristol Communication Symposium that is co-sponsored by the Communication Transfer Program and FRC Media, our partner. Uh, and every semester we try and bring someone to talk about an issue or a trend or their experience that is vital to the field of communication. So that's why we have three communication courses joining us today. Uh, so as I was uh, saying beforehand, I was on sabbatical last semester, in the spring that is, and what that means in the academic world is after you've been here for a certain amount of time, you can apply to work on a special research project and you're reassigned from your classes and you spend your time doing that and then you're asked to share it. So um, I figured I'd just take a light topic that like doesn't affect any of us um, of fake news and see if I could get a handle on what's going on. So let me give you a little bit of background about myself just very briefly. I, uh, like many of you, worked my way through college. I went to a state college in Virginia and majored in journalism with a minor in political science always wanted to be a journalist. From the time I was nine years old, I was gonna be a reporter. And I had the fire, we say you get, especially if you go into print journalism, you get ink in your blood and you never get it out. So I had the fire that we live in a democracy and we have these freedoms that so many other countries don't of really being able to help the public know what's going on and that we as reporters have access to places that other people would not have access. And I was very proud to be a journalist and really worked hard. I was sometimes told you care too much uh, to make sure that we had our stories as accurate as possible and that they were done as quickly as possible because usually there is a time element. Uh, many things have changed since then. So I'm gonna jump right into kind of where I go. Um, and as I say, there is this fake news crisis and that it really is the erosion of freedom of the press in our country and democracy. So I'm gonna kind of throw a lot of information out at you. I'm trusting that's working, okay? Uh, I'm gonna throw a lot of information out, kind of speak quickly, because this is a huge topic, but I do have at the end uh, where some of the sources came from, and if any of you have a really more, yeah, want to know more, uh, just you know, send me an email. Um, the email's right there, shelley.murphy at bristolcc.edu, and I'd be happy to share these with you, uh, because you could immerse, I mean, you, know, you could do a dis dissertation, a doctoral dissertation on this topic, and I'm doing a one-hour presentation, <laughs> okay? So that being said, we're gonna jump right in. Thank you guys for being here. I know not all of you plan on being journalists, but uh, freedom of press being the, our access rights being limited will affect no matter what part of communication you are planning on going into. All right, so fake news, we hear it all the time, right? You know, wherever you're getting your news from, where do you guys get your news from? Throw it out at me, where are we getting news from? Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. CNN. CNN, awesome, I like that one, okay. Twitter, what else did I hear? Buzzfeed, Facebook, okay. So a lot of social media, and they're kind of what's called aggregators, that they don't actually create content, they get it from other places, and a lot of times those other places, we don't really know what their criteria is for gathering and fact-checking, etc. So it's a slippery slope, I say here, um, that what's become with fake news is, you know, if I don't like it, if I don't agree, it's fake news, right? We kind of, have you noticed that when you're on your Facebook feeds? If something posts something that you get a visceral reaction to that it's just, <laughs> uh, do you spend more time researching it or do you just say, eh, I don't like that, it's fake, scroll? probably live latter, right? All right, we're gonna look at the danger of what that is. Okay, so the first thing I did as part of my sabbaticals, I went to this really cool place called the Newsium. It's a museum about news coverage. And sadly, it is the financial struggles that are affecting journalism as a whole are affecting the museum. And they just sold their iconic building in uh, Washington, D.C. that was right overlooking, it was like, looked down the mall and kind of was that watchdog that we talk about the press being the watchdog over the government. Uh, they just sold it for oodles of money. And uh, they say they're gonna get another building somewhere in D.C., but I think the museum part of it is probably history. Uh, however, their online presence is gonna continue. So I made a point of getting there before it closed because it's like been on my bucket list to get to the museum and it closes December 31st so you know you have a month <laughs> to get down to DC but anyway they call this a fake news global crisis too this was one of the displays and some things I want to point out here about this uh, hopefully you guys can read this part of the slide as I zoomed in 
uh, that they're saying that around the globe, re regressive regimes are calling legitimate news fake news. And when they refer to regressive regime, repressive regimes, regimes, excuse me, you usually think of where? What countries do you think of as a repressive regime? Go ahead. South Korea. South Korea? Well, maybe North Korea more than South Korea? Yeah, yeah. yeah. South, South Korea is the one that is still democratic, but North Korea definitely. Uh, we've seen all kinds of headlines of journalists and just average American citizens being murdered and tortured and jailed there. Where else would you think of as a repressive regime? China. China. Yeah, anyone following what's going on right now with uh, Hong Kong, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we don't necessarily think of having the President of the United States mentioned in the same paragraph as talking about repressive regimes, okay? But they talk about that if, if it's negative of their policies, Russia's been known for doing this too, uh, that if, if, they don't, if it doesn't agree with your policies of the official government policy, that it is considered uh, fake news. The journalist also, also, often loses their credibility, they lose their credentials, and in some place they even lose their freedom. They get put into jail. Uh, generally, that has not been the case in America, but this is presenting an issue globally as more and more news that is not really fact-checked and necessarily credible is spreading like wildfire on the internet. And you guys know this. I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, I ran across this on the internet and thought it was just perfect. Most memes are kind of problematic, but new game show, facts don't matter. I'm sorry, Jeanette, while your answer was correct, Walter doesn't believe it. Therefore, it's fake news. Isn't that kind of where we are? Mm -hmm. All right. Then we have an invasion of fake news. Every meme is getting every culture character you can imagine has something in there about fake news. My mouse doesn't want to go. Okay. So I'm going to give you two examples of fake news that you probably are familiar with. I'm going to grab this mic because I have to move and I think you're not going to hear me. Okay. So. You may have heard about this of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, this was late summer, I believe, that this went viral, that uh, they were saying she was drunk when she was delivering a speech. Yeah. And if you really look at what's happened, and I'll just play the video. Okay, so they go into the one where you guys probably saw of, of uh, President Barack Obama being uh, where someone else is voicing over and having him say all kinds of negative things about Trump. So these are called deep fakes. And it's hard to tell. I mean, if you did not see the first video of Nancy Pelosi, would you have thought something's a little off on that second video? Yeah. yeah. Probably would have thought something was off with her, though, right? Not with the video itself. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's subtle. All right, you guys may remember when after the Parkland shooting that a group of uh, students became activists against this. And you may, do you guys remember when the uh, video went around that showed Emma Gonzalez tearing up the Constitution? Okay, so it's really hard as you're scrolling through your feed, and a good number of you told me that that's how you get your news. Uh, as you're scrolling your, through your feed, are you taking the time to figure out where did this come from? And I kind of wanted to take a look at, there's, the librarians are doing a great job here at BCC on uh, information literacy and helping you have the tools and know-how to uh, know whether it comes from a good source. I guess I want to give you kind of some motivation as to why you should take the time to figure this out. Not just for if you're doing a paper for college, but as a member of a democratic society, if we aren't involved, and especially as people, most of you, if you're in these comm classes, are many of you are likely comm majors. If we're not involved in protecting the freedoms we have now, that has major implications for our society as a whole. Okay, so. All right, let me see if I can get out of the video. Thank you. All right, so what is fake news? All right, it's not new for one thing. I want you guys to realize that people talk about it and some people think that President Trump created fake news. Okay, he may have popularized the term fake news, but the concept goes back from probably from caveman days, okay? From the, as soon as humans started communicating, someone would twist the facts to try and get their way. All right? Kind of makes sense. That's kind of human nature, right? Well, propaganda has been around forever. Okay, we'll talk about some specific ones later in this speech. But deliberate misinformation or specific emphasis on something kind of ignoring a whole nother aspect of the story. And we see that happen a lot. Yellow journalism was a whole uh, phase of journalism where they were sensationalizing, perhaps for a good impact. They were looking at child labor in some of these really uh, dangerous 
environments where kids were working 14, 16 hours, losing limbs from the machines, et cetera. And yellow journalism kind of exposed some of that, but it was really out there and it could easily have been labeled fake news, okay? Satire has been around forever. How often do you see an Onion article shared and somebody thinks it's real news? Okay, the Onion is clearly satire. The advent of the CNN um, or the Comedy Channel, both of them having fake news shows that were comedy, the Daily, New, the Daily Show and what was Colbert's show before the Daily Show, I can't remember. Uh, but he now has the Colbert Report on HBO, okay? Those look like news, right? They look like they're an anchor, they look like they're delivering the news, but it's satire, okay? The meme makers have made it so easy for us to spread fake news, and of course, if you don't like it, claim it's fake news. So, as I was working on this sabbatical, I'm trying to get a handle on, gosh, where do I go to try and narrow this down? And I found out that there's a group in Harvard and there's a group in the European Union that have been working on this for quite some time, even before the 2016 election, okay? Now, we all know in the 2016 election, there is some concern that perhaps foreign influencers, uh, foreign governments were involved in what was happening and influencing our election, okay? And most of it was done through Facebook, all right? So he's an Emmy Award journalist who worked at a lot of very prominent shows and decided to switch into this and really try and get a better handle on how do we preserve. Kind of what I'm trying to do in a sabbatical, but he's now dedicating his life to it, all right? So they have, and they I mean both the Harvard group and the group from European Union, uh, which works on human rights, and they view uh, this freedom of press, freedom of speech as a basic human right, all right? So that's how it falls under that. They classify it to three levels based on the intent and the level of impact. So the first one, that gray circle, is it's misinformation, it's false, okay? But you didn't necessarily mean to be harmful. It's kind of like when you share some information that someone told you, you don't take time to double check it, and you find out later that you spread something that was inaccurate, and you can maybe feel a little bit bad, but you only told your friend, and it only goes to a few people, and it's not a huge big deal, and you didn't mean it maliciously, all right? That's the disinformation, uh, misinformation. The disinformation in that middle where it crosses between false and harmful, is both false and harmful, is what most of what we call fake news is. And they're trying to encourage us to stop using the term fake news because fake news is so politically charged and again both sides have used it as a weapon against the other the point is it's disinformation it's inaccurate information that is being used with an intent of causing harm and then the final is is malinformation and that is um, Totally, completely design, trying to be um, harmful. It may be true. It's like when things leak, uh, private memos leak, um, WikiLeaks stuff would have been called in malinformation by some people. Um, other people said it was for the greater good. Uh, depends on which side of the, of the equation you feel on that. But the point is, it was real information, it was factual, but it was still or could be perceived as harmful. So we're talking about disinformation. We're living in the world of disinformation for what we call fake news, okay? And they talk about uh, different types of disinformation. I just explained everything on that sheet, so we're going to the next one. Okay, so they talk about seven forms of information disorders, what they call this big picture. All three of them fall under information disorder. All right, did you know that we have a disorder in our society around information? I don't find it shocking, but I like that they call it that. Okay, so we talked about these are the main, basically, are you doing misleading content? Are you making fake content? Have you just fa outright fabricated the content? Uh, is there a false connection being made, which we see happen a lot in pictures that have been doctored? Is there a false context? Maybe these people really were in that picture, but they weren't what, doing whatever you've implied that they're doing, or have you just outright manipulated the context, okay? For our, for our purposes, I think disinformation is all we really need to know is that we need to be thinking about we do not want to be spreading that and we need to understand it a little bit better. So what are the challenges, he says. This is Cameron Hickey uh, speaking, the guy from Harvard. Uh, first is identifying the original source. So much of it is on the dark web that it's really hard to find where it's coming from. Uh, one thing he said that I thought was pretty interesting is that he found one of the best ways for him to start identifying some of this stuff was to like other people on his Facebook that were sharing this stuff and then you could go back to where they got it. And he found that his grandmother was a great source of this. Wow. <laughs> because again, she's not using the same critical thinking on the internet 
um, that we might have been taught to use, okay? Um, we're not taking the time to do it, most of us. She just never even thought about it. She's thinking if it's on the internet, it must be true. All right, so I thought that was pretty interesting. But you also have, is it a bot farm or is it real people? All right, are these false identities being put there? There's some nuanced, nuanced content, which is much harder for us to even recognize that it's wrong, like that Nancy Pelosi clip. Real easy to not know that that was a problem, okay? Uh, also, people make a lot of money doing this. That's the bottom line. They make a lot of money every time you like or share it. So if for no other reason, stop, you might want to stop doing that because you're putting money in the pocket of someone who doesn't care about whether this is true or who they're hurting. Now, if that's your thing, let's have another conversation. But most of us wouldn't knowingly do that, okay? Um, interesting that Twitter has said they will not take political ads for the 2020 campaign. Facebook has not said that. Facebook is saying that they're going to tweak their formula and their algorithms and make it harder for them to target you, blah, blah, blah. Um, just today I heard on NPR on my way in this morning that Google is saying that they are going to limit ads and that they're going to be looking at that. Now, what that's going to mean for YouTube, we, it remains to be seen. But the bottom line, whether it's been proven in court or not that the 2016 election was influenced by people doing things like this with fake news or disinformation on the internet, uh, certainly these providers are concerned about it because they don't want to be sued and held liable, okay? All right, so the news used to tell you that something happened and then you had to decide what you thought about it. Now the news tells you how to think about something and then you have to decide if it even happened. That's kind of where we are. How many of you guys watch any newscast? I don't care which station it's from. All right, I have about more than I would have thought, about a dozen, awesome. Okay, if you're watching MSNBC, challenge yourself to watch Fox News as well. If you're watching Fox News, challenge yourself to watch MSNBC. You're gonna get two extreme versions of the news. Yeah. And maybe between the two of them, you can find somewhere where the middle is. We used to be able to say that CNN was kind of that middle ground. It's not as good as it used to be, but it's still better than the two extremes. Uh, BBC, believe it or not, covers our, our stuff a lot. They're pretty good. Reuters is pretty good. But go to one, more than one news source, okay? Because why has all this happened? How did we get here that people, the news stations, are no longer delivering the news the way they would have back in the 60s and 70s? Well, it comes down to two things. First is the Fairness Doctrine, okay? In 1949, the FCC required anyone with a broadcast license that they had to cover news, that they had to cover things of important uh, entrance, interest to the voter, basically, to the citizens, and they had to give op uh, opposing viewpoints, contrasting viewpoints. It's what also sometimes became as fair time. You may have heard the phrase fair time. All right, that actually went more with like, well, anyway, it was related, okay. In 1987, after much debate and much lobbying, the FCC, which had been weakened a lot by that time, politics got involved in all of this as well, uh, they abolished the fairness doctrine. They said there's so much more competition now with satellite and cable and all of these different channels. It's not just a few uh, radio stations and a few TV stations who have a license from us to use that air, okay? Because remember, the air up in the air where the signals go is a public commodity, is how this all came to be. So they said there's so many other ways that people are getting their information. This is outdated, and some argued that it was actually an impingement on free speech, that you were requiring them to talk about something that maybe they didn't want to, okay? The other side of it was, no, it's our way of protecting the public's right to know. If you're not requiring them to cover things of substance and to show all sides, how is the average person going to get their information? Who knows? The bottom line is, it was abolished. So we had a free-for-all, all right? Go after that. And that's when you saw more and more like satellite radio. You saw, you know, Howard Stern coming out there saying whatever he wanted. And, and as long as they don't go too far and violate public, especially on satellite, they can say or do almost anything they want. But even on the mainstream stations, they no longer were held back, if you will, or required to be fair. Okay, and fair and objective has always been our basis for news. So, what happened? Well, now we have this explosion of technology. Virtually everybody in this room probably has a smartphone, right? How many of you guys have had to resist the urge to look at your smartphone while I've been talking? 
okay? We're addicted, there's actual research on this that I'm not gonna go into, that we're addicted to looking at our smartphone because it gives us that inter, in, instant gratification, especially if there's somebody has wanted to know you at that time, okay? Uh, so we are self-selecting by isolating ourselves into our smartphones and thinking that our Facebook news feed or our Twitter feed is giving us news, okay? It really is not a news feed. It is stuff that you have self-selected or someone has selected for you with the advertising algorithms. And you are living in this very narrow bubble. Uh, and if you're not aware of that, and I'm not criticizing you guys because hey, we all are. Unless you're taking a concerted effort not to be, you're in a bubble that is not really helping you become a well-rounded, informed citizen within a free press democracy. Okay, so the first thing was the fairness doctrine went away. The second thing that happened is this pressure there are actually three things. This pressure to make money, okay? Advertising revenues went down as you had, the, the audience was more and more divided with this explosion. There was fewer and fewer ad dollars to go around, plus the revenue, you know, people were advertising elsewhere. Plus, of course, the economy went down in two, so there wasn't a lot of ad revenue. And so there was this great struggle to find other ways for news, news uh, channels and stations and uh, mag uh, newspapers, et cetera, to make money because doing good journalism cost a lot of money, all right? And so there was, all, there was all this struggle to capture, build, and retain an audience. And you're competing with all kinds of things. Now, when I went into the business, there was a hard line between advertising side, the business side of the house, and the news side of the house. And it was never to be broached, okay? The general manager never came and said, you will, will or will not run a story on a particular thing because it might impact one of our advertisers. That was just totally taboo, it did not happen. It happens daily now, okay? <laughs> because they're just trying to make a living, all right? So it's no longer a slippery slope of infringement between those two. We have gone off the cliff, just like Wile E. Coyote. We have just run off the cliff and who knows where we're gonna go. So how we fund journalism is not something I can solve today, but it is part of this problem. Okay, then there was even more pressure. Clickbait, other people like BuzzFeed were making lots of money. Yeah. BuzzFeed came out of virtually nowhere. Suddenly they had this huge audience stealing from the mainstream and they had a formula to make money. And part of it was clickbait and using lots of lists, native content, which is an, a news story that looks like it's a news story, but really small, it will say sponsored by so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's called native content if you didn't know it. Um, and for those of us who grew up in the era where they're supposed to be totally separated, that is just like a total taboo. You just don't trick your reader to do that. Uh, and social media, of course, was drawing from their audience. So an analysis by BuzzFeed found that, this is amazing to me, in the 2016 election, the top 20 fake news, I would call it information, uh, disinformation news stories, received more engagement on Facebook than the top 20 election stories. So the real stories that were presenting real information were not getting any much look at all. The ones that were receiving the most were the fake news. Does that jive with what you guys remember from that election? What were you sharing, okay? And hey, I'm just as bad. I'm not pointing a finger. I've learned a lot in the last few years and I've disfriended some people and I don't share some things I used to share. Um, okay, so some of this comes from Jill Abramson, and this is sort of a turning point for our industry. She was a long-term editor at the New York Times and she was fired for refusing to run native content. Okay, she'd been there all this time and she said, this is a disservice to our readers and uh, we're not going to be like BuzzFeed. Well, that's not who we are. That's not our brand. So she was speaking at the museum when I was up there, which was just wonderful. Of course, I coordinated it that way. But she talked about a couple things. That one thing is that not all news is likable. And if you think about it, BuzzFeed and Facebook and Twitter, all of them are, are based on people wanting to like and share. And not all serious news, where you're really covering all sides of the issue, make you go, wow, that was great, let me share that, all right? 
But she was saying they wanted them to make all news likable, and that's just not news, that's entertainment, okay? Uh, and she also says that there was this expect expectation that they would have breaking news every day, because that's, uh, that's what clickbait does, excuse me, that's what BuzzFeed does. They pretty much have a breaking news story every day. Well, that's not reality. Okay, this week and last week with the impeachment hearings, maybe it is. But normally, there is not a breaking news story every day. And that basically, it was everything that journalism has stood for was being uh, Cut. So she says the expectation to know everything in real time is not realistic. There's no time to do your due diligence. And we know, we've seen this many times when the reporters have been talking live. Uh, the Boston Marathon uh, bombing was a perfect example. The guy got a phone call while he was on the air live. And it was from one of his sources saying that the um, suspect had been caught. Do you guys remember this? Mm -hmm. And he ended up with huge egg on his face because it was totally wrong. And they didn't catch him for like another six, eight hours. Uh, but again, it really is, uh, you can't just have an update every two seconds and have it be accurate. Okay, so there's competition over everything, and I just I had to throw in a few jokes here because this is a serious topic. Uh, but fake news is now saying CNN is the fake news, and CNN says, nah, uh, you are. <laughs> and that's kind of how it's become, right? Yeah. It's really become like, um, sometimes I feel like it's children arguing uh, when you turn on the mainstream um, shows. Okay, let me point this out to you again in a way that it's become it's been coming for a long time, and I want to show a little, news, a little clip from the movie Broadcast News. And I remember when the movie Broadcast News came out, I was working in newspapers, and my then fiancé, I think, he's been my husband for 30 years now, but I think he was my fiancé at the time, uh, he was working in TV news. And we always had this competition about that print was the real news, and broadcast was entertainment. Um, the broadcast was going down this really scary road of leading us to entertainment and that changing the expectations, all right? So this is a clip, just a quick clip, and here I go walking over to the screen without the uh, mouse. This is a quick clip from, uh, she is presenting, she's a, like a big executive producer or something, and she is presenting, okay, I'm used to a mal, uh, Mac. Uh, she is presenting at a major conference of uh, journalists, of broadcast news journalists, and she ha she's talking about the future of journalism and how scary this all is, where are we gonna go? And I, when I was, as I was putting this into my clip, I said, oh wow, this audience is gonna be very similar to my audience. Hopefully none of you will do the behavior they're doing. But anyway, let's just listen to a little bit of this clip. I remember, I remember when that news clip aired, not when broadcast news came out, but when that news clip aired with all the little uh, dominoes going down and thinking how clever it was of the kids to have done that and all that, and thinking the same thing she said. It's not news, but it's entertaining. It should be on Entertainment Tonight, right? Think about the newscast now. Every newscast virtually ends with some piece of fluff. And that's okay, we have to have a balance in our world, but it is showing again that people don't want you know, be careful what you ask for, you may get it. People don't really want really well-researched well and reflective news. And what does that mean for a democracy? All right, so there we go. All right, so the problem persists and it's worsening. Uh, breaking news, countless people on Facebook are still sharing fake news. Okay, this was a study that was conducted just this month, not this meme, I'm just using the meme to introduce it, but uh, it's, it's conducted by a group, a nonprofit group, whose mission is to research and stop the share of, of disinformation uh, to protect the, uh, a democracy, okay? So that's what their whole mission is. Okay, so this is new information. All right, it's getting, not only is it worsening, it's getting exponentially worse. 86 million estimated views of disinformation on Facebook alone in the last three months alone. And what's even more, um, startling about that number, if you will, is that they only count the information that they had taken the time to fact check and debunk. So there was a whole lot more that they didn't have the time or couldn't for sure debunk, all right? So this is only what they could prove was disinformation. And that is more than three times as much as the preceding three months. So basically, as we're getting more and more involved in the political election season, season with the debates and the Democrats has, what, 25 people running right now? I don't even know what it's down to. Um, but as we're getting closer to where things really are going to get you know, into the thick of things, there's more and more disinformation. This is not a coincidence, I would say, OK? Um, and another point that they made is more than 90% 
of the fake news stories that went viral were negative and most were about Democrats and liberals. So when you get at to where is the source of this information, okay, and that's why I mentioned that, okay? Um, and no surprise that what goes viral is negative, all right? Negativity spreads, we know this. Um, of the positive news that they found, it was a very small proportion, and 100% of it was about the Republicans or the conservatives. Who's creating most of this disinformation? People who are supporting the conservative movement uh, based on this one study, okay? caveat there, it's one study, but it is an international nonprofit uh, working to uh, protect it. So they have their own agenda. Okay, I did want to give you an example of one piece of, of fake news that isn't liberal, okay? So this went last February, um, saying that Trump's grandfather was a pimp and that he was a tax evader and that his father was a member of the KKK, all right? They couldn't exactly support this uh, so by convincing evidence, but what they basically, the author who wrote about this in her book about Trump's family, um, which is called Trump's Three Generations That Built an Empire, uh, says that apparently one of the businesses owned by the grandfather um, did apparently host prostitution. Doesn't mean he was a pimp, but that there were some, some arrests made there of prostitution. So that part can be true. Um, but she wouldn't call him a pimp. Um, Trump's father, Fred Trump, was de detained at a KK protest in the Queens Borough of New York City in 1927 when the Klan brawled with police. Uh, but he was released without charges. So does that mean he just happened to be walking by the street when the rally was going on? Or does that mean his political influence and money got him not charged? We don't know. So anyway, this is not necessarily true. And there is no evidence that he was actually a KK member. And as far as the tra tax evader, it was not attributed to any source at all. But I felt strongly, to be fair and objective, that I had to show that it, it isn't just the conservatives and Republicans creating these, these memes and sharing them, okay? It is from everywhere. So the bottom line around this, uh, from this sub survey, is that politi politically relevant disinformation has reached over 150 a eight estimated viewers, all right? That's enough to reach every reported registered voter, registered voter in the US at least once, okay? Now there are a lot of registered voters who do not vote and who do not actively participate in the party, in the uh, policy uh, or of this. So my guesses would be that it's probably reaching most of the register, uh, most of the active voters multiple times, right? Because the registered voters who aren't involved probably aren't looking at the stuff and sharing it to begin with. So this is kind of scary as we approach our next election. Okay, so that's fake news. Now I want to talk, I'd be remiss to not talk just a little bit about what is real news and what can we do about this, okay? Whether you want to be a journalist or not, you are a consumer of news and you shouldn't be sharing stuff that is news. So what is news? I know my journalism class is here, you guys already know, and you're like, why are we doing this again? All right, basically, what makes news? What happened today and is planned or likely to occur tomorrow? Okay, something of interest. It needs to be relevant, useful, and interesting to the target audience. Uh, it should be written in a way that is accurate, brief, as brief as it can be, and clear. All right, how often do you read something, you have to look at it a couple of times, you still don't understand exactly what they're saying? Okay, sometimes that's deliberately to hide some of the message or hide where they did not go reporting. All right, should have multiple sources and be confirmed, and it should make an effort to show all sides of the issue. Okay, we used to say show both sides, but we know some issues are more complex. There's far more than two sides. You're trying to show as many sides of the issue as you can. All right, what are the basic criteria? All right, is, does it have impact on people? Is there conflict? We do like novelty. Uh, is it about a prominent person? It's why we hear so much about celebrities in our world, because we decided that they're prominent, uh, which is the entertainment sneaking in that I worry about. Is it local? That would make it more interesting. And uh, does it engage your audience? Does it propose a solution? So let me say in other words, what, do you, what makes news? This is a cliche, but hey, you've heard it before. Dog bites man, that's not news. When the man bites the dog, that is news, but it's soft news. It's not urgent to our world, okay? But it is a novelty, so you would see it reported. Activities of government, school board, businesses, crimes, courts, serious uh, accidents, hard news, okay? That you should be hearing about, and we do hear about it, okay? Almost too much sometimes. That has the impact, the conflict, the timeliness, all of that. A mayor of a host city is charged with crimes, hard news 
couldn't imagine who I'm talking about now, right? Um, and that, that was covered for days and days, weeks, all right? Because it hit all of these, these criteria. It had impact, it had conflict, it was pro he was a prominent citizen, it was timely. That's the stuff you should be looking for for news. When it's stuff that comes out of left field, you gotta wonder why is this being shared now and is there another agenda, okay? The Kardashians breathe. Soft news prominence. I mean, I don't know, where did the Kardashians even come from? How they became celebrities? But they sell nice clickbait. They sell, they make a lot of money, all right? So if your news looks like a meme, it probably is not news. Just keep that in mind. Whenever you see a meme, reject the urge to share because it's most likely not 100% true. There may be an element of truth, but it's not the full picture. All right, so let's look at the job of a journalist traditionally within our country and within any other countries, okay? All the cliches, again, that you may have heard, and some of these come from the textbook that I'm using. Comfort the afflicted, afflict the comfortable, all right? Watchdog against the powerful, powerful, voice of the voiceless, surrogate for the ordinary citizen. We can go places the ordinary citizen doesn't because that's our job. You guys are out doing other jobs. We're out there doing this. And the protector of the abused and the downtrodden. Okay, Carl Bernstein, who was one of the reporters for the Washington Post that did the investigative reporting that led to the uh, resignation of President Nixon, uh, the Watergate era, you will hear this called, uh, because that was the name of the um, office building that was broken into when the Republicans broke into the D Democratic National Headquarters. Hey, those of you who know it, how's that for a quick capture of what happened with, uh, with Watergate? Okay. Um, so he says that you really need to work to get the obtainable, best attainable version of the truth. We can never have the full truth. Even in court, they often don't get the full truth. But we have to strive to get the best attainable, and that means asking tough questions, getting the multiple sources. So when you're reading a story, ask yourself, what else would I want to know? Who else would have a say in this? And if that's not being reported, you likely have some disinformation going on, okay? Another thing is that journalists are, are accused of being biased, okay? Well, first of all, all human beings have some form of bias. We come with our, our experience, our background, and we as journalists are trained to kind of put that back and just do our jobs. But based on what I just told you, what is journalism, uh, the things that make news tend to be the more sensational stuff, okay? We don't cover the car accidents that don't occur. We don't cover the plane crashes, the, the planes that didn't crash. And we don't cover when lawmakers and everyone are doing their jobs well and spending the money as expected. That's expected to happen, that's not news. We also don't cover paint drying, okay? It's kind of the same concept. So when people accuse us of being liberal, I want you to kind of keep that in mind. What is journalism? Again, this goes back to the museum, the little pictures on the side, okay? The purpose, purpose is to provide people with the information they need to be free and self-governing, okay? And that, uh, that comes from the elements of journalism. This is from the museum. They say the press as watchdogs is a big part of what we are because, as you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? Okay, so... Most journalists do see themselves as watchdogs. Um, they help ha protect the public from those who would do harm to them. Um, others say journalists are, go are getting too out in your face, okay? Well, let's take a look at what's going on to for journalists who are just trying to do their job. Uh, first, a quote from Thomas Jefferson. If I had to choose between government without newspapers and newspapers without government, I wouldn't hesitate to choose the latter. This is one of the founders of the Constitution, right? Is saying that basically, we need the watchdogs. All right, so let's look at the history of journalism and the US government um, kind of quickly here. I'll rush through this last part. World War II, uh, journalists were willing members of, uh, of sharing propaganda. The idea was that it was for the greater good, and uh, Dan Rather ta uh, talks about this, and there's also a great documentary called The War You Don't See that talks about that for the greater good, we went along and st st shared stories that really weren't true. Um, part of it was to hide the movements of the troops and to protect them, okay? So at that time, we were very much in cahoots with the government, but for a greater good, okay? That started changing. We, in the mid-1950s, communists, the Cold War was like rampant, and uh, McCarthyism started, where they really were labeling every, anyone who didn't agree with them, basically, <laughs> was instead of being called fake news, they were called a communist, and they would be blacklisted. 
and they couldn't get in, couldn't get jobs, couldn't get access. And, and this wasn't just journalists, okay? This was regular citizens, a lot of people in Hollywood. Uh, but basically, blacklisting journalists was not limited to America, okay? We, we maybe hopefully didn't kill the journalists we blacklisted, at least not to my knowledge, but others have done this throughout time. Hitler, Stalin, uh, Nixon definitely blacklisted journalists if you didn't agree with him. Trump certainly has. He's removed credentials. They've actually stopped daily press briefings at the White House, which is like virtually unheard of in the modern time. He's had I don't know how many press secretaries, um, and I don't even know if he has one right now. Um, they, I think he has someone, but she's only done one press conference or something. Okay. Uh, obviously, Kim Jong Un from uh, North Korea. We know really bad things happen to journalists there and to average citizens. Okay. The Vietnam War pro protests were another turning point. Okay. It was the first time that journalists trying to cover these protests as objective journalists saw our own troops being turned on college citizens. Okay. Kind of like what's going on in Hong Kong right now. All right, and a lot of journalists started doubting whether we should still be supporting taking the government at its word. Up to that point, we kind of took the government at its word. Watergate is when that polite barrier was totally broken. They were lied to so much that they said, you know, we're in your face now. And that's kind of been what journalism is now. During the Reagan era, as I said, the Fairness Doctrine was abolished. Uh, post 9-11, things got even worse for journalists, um, not only, and for many other people, okay? There was all that anti-Islamic phobia. Um, patriotism was rampant, and if you did anything that made you look like you were supporting anything other than the, the message from the government, you were not quite blacklisted, but you were considered unpatriotic. That was the new version of, of a communist from McCarthy. And Homeland Security and the Patriots Act. The Patriots Act was meant to follow financial routes, okay? It was, it was a banking act. But buried in there, I mean, it's a huge document, was this little piece that has created a movement for a national shield law for journalists. Because buried in there was this little bit that said, if you were in any way whether you're a private citizen or a journalist, were considered doing something that could be um, not for the best interest of the government. They had the right to tap your uh, phones and to follow you and to tap your emails, et cetera, um, basically spy on, on American citizens and American journalists, okay? And from that also came the fact that if you were hiding an anonymous source, kind of like the, watch, the whistleblower we have right now with the impeachment hearings, okay? Journalists, lots of times when we're investigating, doing investigative reporting, it is about something that if they really stood up and said what they were saying, they probably would be fired or have something else bad happen to them. So we're protecting confidential sources is a big part of investigative journalism. Now you suddenly had people being thrown in jail, um, which, had, which had always been on the books that you could be con um, declared in contempt of court, but really never enforced. But the Patriots Act gave it stronger um, enforcement power. Um, and then the Trump issue, uh, administration, as I say, we continue to see total disrespect for the, the job of the media and uh, daily br briefings have even stopped. And it's not just the job of the media, it's informing the public of what they're doing. That is a basic thing. We elect officials, we expect to know how they're spending our money, okay? All right, so the attack on journalism has become pretty intense. You guys have probably all seen this tweet uh, where uh, he sent out multiple ones like this, but this is way back in February of 2017. Fake news media failing at New York Times, at NBC, at ABC, at CBS, and CNN is not my enemy. It is the enemy of the American people. So when they start calling an entire field that is meant to be the watchdog, the enemy of the American people, it's kind of scary. And it has had some results. So first off, there is the First Amendment that protects our, you know, gives us the ability to do what we're, we're, we're trying to do that he doesn't like. But these words have also led to some real changes in American policy toward the field of journalism. All right, it's not just a matter of tweets and rallies and blacklisting and name calling and arrest for not revealing sources, not to say that it would be pleasant to be put in jail because you wouldn't reveal your source, but it gets worse. We now have shootings and kidnappings and I didn't want to put this in print, but there's also even been a beheading of an American journalist, okay? Um, so there is definitely a target on uh, freedom of the press. 
Okay, so just two examples I want to share with you about these. Reporters have a right to report based on the uh, Constitution and the First Amendment. Um, in June 2018, a gunman came in, um, he killed four journalists and men injured many more in the Gazette newsroom in Annapolis, Maryland. And it was very clear from his social media and from statements he made that he was inspired by some of the hate rhetoric that he was hearing coming from uh, the, the Republican Party and Trump, okay? Let me point out, they had a shooting in their newsroom. They lost colleagues and still managed to get the newspaper out that day, all right? I mean, that is commitment to your job against all odds, okay? Uh, in October 2018, you guys may remember uh, the Jamal Khashoggi, uh, who was a Saudi Arabian dissident who came to America because he was being persecuted in Saudi Arabia because he was saying things that the Saudi Ar uh, Arabian prince didn't like. He was reporting things that were fake news because they didn't like it. Okay, so he comes to America, he'd been living here for quite some time, still a Saudi uh, uh, citizen, but working for the Washington Post, a, a main American outlet. Uh, as you guys may remember, he went to the consulate to get some paperwork to be for marriage and wasn't seen for days and gradually it trickled out that they, uh, the prince had sent people to kill him, okay, in a very nasty way. The American government said nothing. We did not support, we just allowed uh, a reporter to be killed. All right, it's not just me who does this research. There is the Reporters Without Borders uh, that works on freedom of information, and they do a world press index every year of uh, the top, I think they do 150 countries, they may go further, I'm not sure. Um, and they look at how freedom of the press is being and how journalists are being treated in all these different countries. So for 2019, they say, we have continued deterioration of pre freedom of the press in the US. Journalists are being challenged by the very institutions on which they report. Sounds a lot like those repressive regimes we hear about, right? Look at the 2019 rankings. I just pulled out a few things for you. Uh, US is 48. Let me get a mouse that will show you this. We are down to 48. We're not in the top 10. We're not in the top 20, we're barely in the top 50 now, all right? And we t typically have been the, the defenders of freedoms across the world, all right? In 2010, which would be about halfway through Obama's first term, and we're about a little bit more than halfway through uh, Trump's first term, so that's why I pulled 2010, we were ranked 20. So we have fallen 28 spots um, since this attack on fake news, all right? Okay, the very first index that was published uh, referred to the poor ranking of the United States. This was in 2002. They thought we had a poor ranking when we were 17, okay? Um, and they said it was mainly because of the number of journalists arrested or imprisoned there. Okay, that's 2002, right after 9-11, 2001. Patriots Act was passed. People were being imprisoned, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that this is not just one administration. And I really want to make that clear. This is not a political thing. It's just a showing of the watchdog role being weakened. And what do we think about that? One other thing I want to show, one other clip. You guys may have seen this. And I walked away from the mic again. I'm sorry. Uh, you guys may have seen this. But as a journalist, this kind of freaked me out. Another thing that's happened since the FCC has lost so much strength um, that there are fewer limits on how many stations a particular company can own. So corporations are owning more and more of our media, meaning they have more and more influence. So let me just show this spot real quick. Hi, I'm Fox San Antonio's Jessica Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility. responsibility. This is extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is Who was that? Frank Coletta, Channel 10 in Providence, which has for the longest time been the most respected news station in the market, okay? This is the corporate influence. They were basically told, you will read this script with minor changes adapting it to your market, or you will be fired, okay? Without any of your retirement or any of the other things that you should have with your contract, all right? So again, journalists are being put in tougher and tougher positions. Had you guys seen that, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some had, some had. Kind of scary. Doesn't it sound a little George Orwellian? Yeah. Okay, everybody reading everything. Okay, we're almost done. We're going to wrap up. All right, so get the scope of the problem. As I told you, I could do a dissertation on this, but we don't have that time, and I don't have time to do a dissertation. 
The museum has put out a bunch of great information about how to simplify this for you, because it is complex. And I have bookmarks, if people want, that shows this uh, poster. It shows the uh, Escape Junk News. And I urge you to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And it has that it says, look at Escape It by looking at the evidence, look at the source, look at the context, the audience, who they're targeting, the purpose, and the execution. Okay, if it looks like a meme with lots of typos and nonsense in it, it probably is not real, all right? And I would also urge you that when you see something that isn't real, make yourself wonder why is someone producing this? And maybe go find out what the real story is, because there's a lot going on in our world. Don't believe everything you read on the internet just because it has a nice picture and a nice quote. I doubt that Abraham Lincoln was talking about the internet, okay? <laughs> Uh, could be wrong, but I doubt he was that forethinking. Okay, what can you do? Take control of your social media, I already talked about that. Like different news stations or news feeds that you might not normally follow. If you just want to get your news from your social media, I understand it's really convenient. Just cultivate what you have in there and get a better mix, right? Seek out those different perspectives with an open mind. Don't do that cognitive dissonance, knee jerk, I don't want to hear this because it, it disagrees with me, all right? And again, avoid those social memes that tick you off. If it gets that strong of an emotional reaction, it probably isn't telling the whole story anyway. Go look for the real story. Uh, unplug a couple times a day. Just breathe for two minutes a day because all this clutter and noise makes it hard for us to distinguish what matters and what doesn't. Confirm before you share, like, or tweet. Report. I mean, get out there and practice this stuff. The best way to notice if something is not legitimate news is to know what goes into legitimate news. And none of that will ever hurt you. That experience will, will build your resume and will help you in whatever job you're going for. That was my little commercial. I'm sorry, I had to throw it in there. Uh, I feel very strongly about that. And vote. If you are not registered, get your tail out there and register. And get out there on those election days. I don't care how you vote, just get out there. Because that silent majority is what's allowing a lot. Okay, here are the resources I mentioned that I had for you guys. Um, the Harvard Center has a whole newsletter on misinformation review that they're doing. Columbia Journalism Review is an awesome source to go to all the time. The museum is still going to be around online. First Amendment Center, excuse me. Uh, the Council of Europe is the one that I was talking about that did a lot of that work with Harvard. Well, actually, Harvard did it with them. The Council of Europe was doing it first. Reporters Without Borders. And if you're really interested in this, again, I will send you these links. These are two articles that are just incredible to read. Um, the CJR, CJR, Trump Inspires a Murrow Moment. It's an opinion column, but it's basically saying, just like Edward R. Murrow during the uh, McCarthy the era said, we can't stand for this. This is just wrong. And he did a whole half hour special that the network refused to promote. So he and his co-producer found the money themselves to promote it. And it basically was saying the government is wrong in this case. And we as citizens need to stand up and do something. And CJR is saying that's what we need to do now. Um, and the New Yorker has a very long article about does, New York, does journalism have a future? But it's really worth reading. All right. My parting thought, this is a commercial. Commercial is always bad. You may have seen this in the um, Super Bowl last year, I think it was, uh, but it could be for any news outlet. So just because the Washington Post did it uh, doesn't mean that it's not valid. Really do believe that, that democracy is a, a freedom and freedom can be granted and freedoms can be taken away. Our country is only 200 plus years old, which in the big his scheme of uh, world history, we are still an experiment and it was based on citizens being involved. So if we're not having access to real information, how can we make informed decisions? And if we're allowing ourselves to not have access because we're too tired, we're too preoccupied with the latest Kardashian uh, crisis, uh, we're also part of the problem, not part of the solution. So with that being said, I really appreciate your attention. We're going to turn it over and see if you guys have any questions. Please wait for the mic. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand and Keith will come up with the mic because we are recording this for FRC Media and we need to have the mic. Any questions? Comments? Wow. I totally blew your mind and you have no other thoughts. Well, I find that hard to believe. Well, Shelly, this was 100% more than I have expected. You have helped me so much. I, even understanding misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. I will speak more accurately now because of this. 
but also I encourage the students to take time for their citizenry, get involved in your local politics as far as being a voice. But with the news writing reporting students, you learned about journalism, but you need to apply it because you learn by repetition over and over again. I can't tell you how strong um, a, um, a much more so strong assistant you will be if you get involved in a newspaper. Right here we have The Hawk. I'm not in advertising for it, but I'm saying I can't think of a better place to really hone in your skills because you got to do it over and over again, even myself. I remember after 9-11, I had a good friend, Nancy Fraze, who's now deceased, and she said, we cannot look at the American journalism on this. We have to look at Europe. We have to go to London. We have to go to South America, the Brazilian press. She had about four or five different news sources that she did regularly when she really cared. I try to follow that practice, but I really, really think this is a great service to all of you right now. Be a leader in your generation. Get involved. But I really, th I'm not just, I think the hawk is fantastic. Uh, for those who don't know, there is a course, three credits attached to it. It's on Wednesdays with Shelly and Tracy um, Furtado Chagas at the lead. And you can get three credits for learning more and more, applying the news writing reporting in real practice and working for the hawk. That would be, look great on your resume, too. Right, but it's really more for your future beyond BCC. I just want to add one little thing that, to, to what Shelley said. You guys have had the, the opportunity to grow up in a time where social media is so important. But historically, it used to be our jobs as communicators to curate the news for people. You know, we decided what was important, what went out there. And in the last 15 years, society has been allowed to self-curate everything it wants to digest. Yeah. And the problem with that is that most people, unlike you guys, are not getting educated in the media. And it's like anything else, when you allow people to just choose, and I'm not saying stupid, I'm saying ignorant, meaning they don't know better. You're allowing people to choose and curate what they take in. They're not going to do that great a job. All right, and I'll leave you with this one last one, one story. You're gonna get challenged. You're gonna get challenged. You know you're doing your job right as a journalist and a communicator if you get challenged, yeah. all right? Recently, with everything going on in Fall River, I was constantly coming to the defense of the Herald News because when you went on their social media, people kept saying, why are you talking about the fact the mayor's got 24 indictments? Don't you have something better to talk about? And I would write in, if the newspaper did not write this story, they would not be doing, as Shelley pointed out so well in her PowerPoint, they would not be doing their job. They would be abdicating their job. So always remember, when people don't like what you have to say, they're going to be more than happy to tell you what they think you should cover. All right? But you have to be steadfast and say, I'm sorry. My journalism teacher, my communication school told me that this is what is significant, therefore, this is what I'm going to write. All right? But just remember, if you're doing your job right, you will be challenged. Hello, Denis Pomawaje. I am a part-time uh, worker for FRC Media. I was also a student at some point, and I was the editor-in-chief of the former Observer, and as the Hawk. Uh, another commercial, please join in writing wow. for the newspaper. Ye yesterday, I attended uh, a meeting where there's uh, a proposition, a stipulation to withhold funds, which kind of shortens uh, uh, the... Uh, the potential of keeping on um, producing newspapers, but that's another topic. It can kind of go with uh, the uh, Washington Post commercial of um, democracy dies in darkness. You need to be aware of the information, whether it's happening in the community, whether it's happening at your college, as informed individuals. And like I mentioned yesterday, I had said, as honest professionals. It doesn't matter what career you're going to go for, Gather the facts, research, do your diligent work in any field you want to go. If you want to practice, the newspaper at the school is a good uh, way, the TV station also. And it's not uh, an ego thing. It's about uh, 
putting out information that will help your community. In this case, if you write for the school newspaper, you're going to help your um, community or here, your audience. If you work for one of the local newspapers, you will help your communities to be informed. And I think that's the public service of a journalist. And you can apply that to any other field. I have done a little bit of newspaper, a little bit of TV station, I work with youth. So I guess that's the kind of change that you can bring to the world, especially in um, when our government tries to uh, dissipate the righteous work that any journalist, good meaning journalist, does. I just wanted to say one thing really quickly. So um, I don't know how many of you guys have been watching the impeachment hearings, but um, I've been watching them since they started. And Nunes, um, a Republican uh, committee member, made a comment yesterday that the ratings were down. And um, so I just wanted to tell everyone that they're happy that people are not paying attention. And whether you watch um, the commentary afterwards on either Fox News or MSNBC, whichever way you lean, I would suggest maybe just watching the hearings and taking whatever you take from it. Because either way, they're going to sway you. But one thing that I can say is that they're happy that we're not watching. Right up there. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to like stuff like this, there's always this dangerous like comfortability with apathy, because of like all like this bombardment of news and like seeing how much like the government does and doesn't do, it feels like it feels like pressure like pressuring to like actually like try and keep up with it, mm -hmm. like with like the Jeffrey Epstein situation where like everyone knows he didn't kill himself, but there's nothing we can do. It's so much easier to just try to ignore it than it is to like actually face that and try and get your own like answers and all that. Anybody else? Up top again. Um, hello. Um, I just wanted to add on to what everyone else had to say. They had some great, um, some great things to tell you guys. I'm also, just like a lot of other people, a share of um, Facebook things that I see on Facebook. And uh, I, um, I know that some of it may be like bad and some of it may be like fake, so I try to stay away from it. And, and I think that it's important for all of you guys just to remember, just like myself, that when you share something, it's more than just pressing a button, and you don't know whose life you could be affecting. So if you share something that's bad, people go into panic. And if it's shared multiple times, then you've created something big by just being a simple part of sharing it. So just be you know, careful of what you share, and, and like Shelly said, do the research and help out your community one by one. That's all. Okay, we're gonna take one more question. Uh, I know some of you have classes that you need to get to, so we need to kind of wrap up. So I'm gonna take this last question and thank you for your time. Hi, uh, yeah, I think, um, I'm a first year by the way. Uh, I think BCC uh, definitely has a lot of good resources that you can try and look at, so um, there's like tons of different stuff that you can do here and, and uh, it's really like um, be, been very good for me because I've I've done things like I went to the women's center I learned about a lot of stuff so definitely get involved um, uh, I, I think it's like br branch out from your community um, and like travel too because that also works so I think it's I think it's a good thing to do Okay, so just one final thought here. We keep talking about go out and get involved, write this, do that. Remember, I know most of you don't want to be journalists, and that's perfectly fine. But any writing you ever do or any producing you do makes you better at whatever job you're going to be applying for. Because to be able to take something complicated and communicate it clearly, which is what we help you learn, will benefit you in the job interview process, and it will benefit you uh, at your first jobs. So consider that if you're looking for a program elective, that's what we're talking about, this COM 212. It's a COM program elective, but it's also a humanities elective. Uh, and if you have any other questions about this or are interested in knowing more, shoot me an email. I obviously would love to talk to you about it. And thank you guys so much for being such an attentive audience. Really appreciate it.